While Naughty Dog's ambitious duology The Last of Us is generally defined as action-adventure, its minute-to-minute -minute gameplay is commonly rooted in horror. And like any good horror, The Last of Us, and particularly The Last of Us Part II, uses its twisted monsters as a reflection of our own very human struggles. The fight between one of The Last of Us Part II's protagonists, Abby, and the monstrous Rat King is particularly rooted in the horror genre. The biggest infected players have encountered in the franchise, the Rat King is introduced at a time when Abby is at one of her lowest points in the story, having become disillusioned with her found family and growing more concerned for individuals rather than the factions currently at war. She's now desperate to help save the life of someone she once may have considered an enemy. This creature puts her and the player by proxy through their paces in an unforgettable sequence. IGN spoke with six members of the development team about the Rat King's creation and how meticulous care teamwork and a unified vision created something so terrifying, yet so deeply cathartic. This is Art of the Level. The Last of Us Part II takes a fascinating approach to one of the most common tropes in gaming boss fights. Most of the sequel's big battles are more human-focused, often not only thrilling in their grounded approach, but in how they twist audience participation and even the player's allegiances during a battle. But the Rat King might be the closest thing to a traditional boss battle. It's a completely bespoke creature that only appears once, evolves the idea of how infected grow from one form to another, and is a true test of a player's firepower and mobility. <laughs> A big problem facing those tasked with designing the Rat King were literally, well, big problems. As in, they weren't sure how big this thing was supposed to be, nor what form it would actually take. At the start, they only knew some sort of larger, scarier monster needed to be created. The designer said uh, all the, the victims that die in the same room, but I don't know how big is the room. Is it going to be a big room, a small room? You know, the, the scales of it. I have, I have no idea. You know, Chiang did these great concepts of just this kind of trailing mass that, you know, all these poor souls, you know, just got stuck to, and, and it was really nightmarish. It's really a hellish thing. Nam took inspiration from Polish and French artists, blending their belief that there is beauty to be found in the horrific with modern horror inspirations like John Carpenter's The Thing and Alien. <laughs> All those inspirations coalesced more elegantly once Nam had a greater sense of the encounter's scale. It would be in a hospital wing, chasing Abby through a series of rooms. So you have to walk around, have some speed on it. So uh, the wrecking design later is evolved into uh, something more structural uh, as a figurative shape, which is able to walk. Although the Rat King was a brand new creature, it still needed to fit into the ecosystem of the past infected. When, when the human gets it, uh, the human becomes like a runner and to the stalker and to clicker to lower. And then they die off and they become tree. But then uh, we, we have to try to find what's in between, you know, like clicker, in between clicker and blower stage. So they kind of Combled together and they become like something else, or 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 is like blow the stage to the tree. Trying to figure out where in the chronology of decay to set the monster became a problem for Nam, but through collaborating with the wider team, including director Neil Druckmann, he was able to whittle down a more defined role for its genealogy. It was yeah, it's like I don't know what to do. So like it's more like caterpillar shape, you know, or a slime shape. But then uh, the Neil uh, in the in the meeting when we when we throw a bunch of different ideas, he was mentioning uh, about what if uh, some other creatures uh, like merged and then you walk like not only feet but then hands like that. So, ooh. and it has its lineage in nature, which of course so too does T. Lu's original virus. The Rat King is a moniker that reaches back hundreds of years to describe a grotesque real life phenomenon. Rats being stuck together by entangled tails and perhaps something else. It's also tragic. After all, the infected were once people. 
So I try to put that kind of sadness in there too. <laughs> but it was very hard to project that you know kind of feeling onto that uh, wrecking uh, in, in the game play. You know what I mean? Because uh, in the game play, the player, if something comes up, come up to you, it's just an enemy. You have to kill it. One way Nam lent more grandeur to the Rat King was to think of it in terms of the naturalistic connection the infected have to the Last of Us world. And the Rat King, I said, I, I just want to think that is, is force of nature, is ultimate force of nature. It's like a like typhoon or like tsunami or when you're facing that, it, that the, that giantness and it just awe, you know, and you're scared. But you don't feel like you can fight back or something. Uh, first of all, you can't kill right away. You have to run away, right? You have to run away in the hallway crazy. Otherwise, you just, they, they just grab you and you do one kill. Running away from this hulking horror is, quite understandably, the first response players might likely have. But now that the team had the look and shape of the king, they actually had to figure out how to make it run and chase after the player. And that pushed The Last of Us Part II's motion capture process to surprising places. So the bones of the Rat King were decided upon. It would essentially be two infected with all their recognizable parts, making up a larger amorphous hole that could stand on its own. But actually getting it to stand up was a unique challenge when it came to the motion capture process. It was just incredibly challenging uh, and it brought our computers to a halt sometimes because it was it was so dense and so heavy there were so many things to it before they could even get to animating this behemoth the naughty dog team needed to come up with a clever way to capture what would essentially boil down to two actors having to act as one but also two given that the rat king comprised a bloater and a super stalker so our first uh test case was we went a little bit more literal like we literally got a, a large actor uh, to play the bloater, a smaller actor uh, down as the super stalker, and then a, the smallest actor we could find that literally was hanging off the shoulder upside down uh, from, <laughs> from, the, from, the, from, the, from the bloater character. And uh, we strapped them all together. It was this whole coordinated mess to kind of get all, all these like humans together and, and, and capture it that way. And it was a fun experiment, but the result is that it was way too slow and cumbersome to, to really move around uh, the volume the way that we wanted this character to, to be. They were just trying to like not drop the person on their head and, you know, and, and just kind of like work their way around the room. The second test case didn't fare much better. They reduced the number of actors from three to two, but this came with its own complications. We joined them at the hip and the the super stalker was almost you know like the the wheelbarrow game or you like hold someone's legs and they kind of like run around run with their their hands it was kind of that sort of a process uh, except a one-armed version of that uh which is also incredibly difficult to do the sheer amount of strength required would ultimately be its downfall naughty dog's motion matching process needed a ton of transition angles Think sharp turns, pivots, and other complex movements for the animation. But this wheelbarrow technique would tire actors out after a couple of takes. And so this method too was ruled out. Finally, the team landed on quite the unique approach, using the idea of a stage technician and bringing in a go-to stunt actor, as well as a pro parkour athlete. We created this, this kind of cage on caster wheels where the super soccer could lay in somewhat like of a, of a hammock and was able to move around with his arm without needing people to hold his legs uh, and he didn't have to put his full weight on his his arm and shoulder and everyone would kind of coordinate and like move this thing around through this unconventional capture the animation got what they needed to bring the rat king to imposing life and it was all in service to the original inspiration the desire to create something truly unsettling the first like real inspiration for how this creature could move and what this could be in the environment was a piece of concept art by uh, one of our artists sebastian and he created this just incredible piece that i mean it looks like a, a frame uh, from a movie 
uh, that was of this shadowy creature. I mean, you almost just saw the silhouette and just kind of like the rim light uh, of this thing uh, bursting out of the door, kind of like rounding a corner. And the whole scene was really dark. The concept art evokes a pretty classic horror rule. What an audience imagines is always much more terrifying than what an artist could conjure. And what else could help conjure something horrible in your mind's eye? Audio. We were designing the sound of this thing before we well knew exactly what the visuals were going to be. We had some ideas that it was going to be this composite creature made from, from multiple parts, but we didn't yet really know what that meant. Um, and so we were able to, to do some previs audio, which is, which is for us a rare treat. Normally we are post-production, we are reactionary to what is being designed. And in this case, we were very much a part of the whole process. One of the principal like design uh, philosophies for infected in general is that we try to stick strictly to human based sound. We're not trying to like grab a whole lot of like elephants and dolphins and like other sort of animals to pepper in uh, in general for like the base level infected. It's all human based. For the Rat King though, because it is this composite creature, we were able to we were able to get a little more creative and add in a bit more of the subjective, otherworldly stuff. While Rob doesn't want to ruin the secret sauce of what Tilu 2 sound designer Bo Jimenez created, he did speak to the overall team's philosophy when trying to not only imagine, but invent what the Rat King would sound like. Part of the process comes from creature actors. Actors who can, well, I'll, I'll let Rob explain. Folks who have very unique abilities to generate uh, disgusting and awful sounding monsters just with their own voices and their own anatomy um, is a pretty special thing. Uh, Helen Goff is, is one in particular that comes to mind. He, he can make these guttural utterances that no human should be able to make. And it was also important that we didn't fall into the trap of just using like multi-voice because it can get very messy. Like if we're trying to represent that it's made of a clicker and a stalker and a runner and a, and a bloater all strapped together, and we just try to play all those elements individually, it would just sonically become noise. You know, a big part of that challenge was maintaining that there's it's made of these other creatures and having elements of them poke through here and there but where the, the creature itself had an entirely new voice that was very much unique. Before the Rat King comes bursting forth into Abby's life via an ambulance doorway, there are clues all around the abandoned, decrepit hospital wing that something ominous is on its way. You have this trauma center that's been blocked away for decades uh, with, with all these these humans kind of like living and growing and festering in there. And that is what gave birth to this Rat King. They all just kind of just melded together in this tight space. Uh, and you you just hear hear clues of it, you know, as you first walk past that, that trauma door. Uh, and then later as you turn the power on and it opens up that lock uh, and, the, and the creature that you've woken up escapes, you, can, you don't see it. You know, there's a couple times where you are pre-combat and you're supposed to be following the trail of the Rat King and just making sure that people are aligned with Abby, thinking like, it makes sense that I'm following this horrific trail, which surely ends in some horrifying monster. Making sure that people just sort of understand why they're doing that. Like we had to do a lot to build up. There, You've already cleared the rest of the hospital. There's no medical supplies elsewhere. The ambulance is your last best option and that that's been justified sufficiently with Nora talking about it, Abby thinking about it, finding that door earlier. So there's a lot of steps to like getting people to understand why they're doing what they're doing and be aligned with Abby. You need power. But that wasn't always the way Abby's pre-Rat King encounter went. As the level was still being devised, one of its earliest iterations had the Rat King following the player, but that was at a time when the hospital itself was a much larger section of the game. We had versions where the Rat King wasn't always sort of trapped just in a closet. We, we had it, versions where it was trapped in a larger area and it was just turning on the power 
that opened a door and that's what allowed it to escape. And in some of those versions we played with actually when the lights first turn on, like seeing it move past and seeing its silhouette briefly, all of those things ended up being, I think just a little bit too much. Though it may be somewhat surprising when it comes to the most ostentatious enemy in The Last of Us Part Two, small specific choices make all the difference in this scenario's development. All of this excruciatingly tense buildup explodes in a moment of horrible catharsis. When the Rat King bursts through the wall of an ambulance Abby is rummaging through, the player knows now that Abby is in an enclosed space with very few exits, and the Rat King's ferocious hello is immediately disorienting, which was, of course, on purpose. <laughs> You hear this thing way more before you see it. And uh, the timing and the beat structure there was all influenced by the audio. So much of the timing of that animation was very much affected by uh, coordinating with the audio. And so, you know, I, I had done a pass, given it to Bo, and he did a pass, and we just kind of like stretched it and uh, gave it more time because we wanted that reveal to just be the slow, audio only reveal as like before you see what this thing is before anyone knows what's happening uh, to have Abby have enough time to get what she needs and then slowly kind of like hear this sun settling thing come closer and closer and uh, you know we've got this incredible spatial audio that you can hear uh, you know, going across the background, and then you finally see the reveal. That holy hell sense of disorienting terror doesn't end at the reveal. Abby's and the player's panic segues into the next part of the Rat King sequence, a chase through a bit of the abandoned hospital wing. Abby's fight or flight instinct kicks in, and let's be honest, no one in Abby's position would want to fight such a horrifying monster. This chase didn't always exist. Abby originally fought the monster right away, but its inclusion helped the team solve some pacing and difficulty aspects of the eventual fight. Early on, the chase sequence didn't exist. The entire chase was originally another phase of fighting the monster. There were sort of two problems that we were trying to solve when we uh, explored adding the chase. It was, for one, the fight was just lasting a really long time. If you imagine an entire extra phase of fighting, like there's a certain point where, you know, our game is about scar scarce resources and having, you know, 33% more, 50% more fighting happening, it just starts to strain believability. It turns a lot of the fight into just scavenging mid-fight. Um, and it, become, it was a little bit repetitious at a certain point. The development team was also having a tough time cracking the transition that saw the Rat King and Abby falling through the floor to another arena where the main showdown takes place. Transitioning this portion from a fight to a chase sequence allowed the team to amp up the Rat King's menacing aura while simultaneously getting players to a point where they and the Rat King could be in close enough proximity to tumble through the floor together. At the first thing we did was just build like a really cheap scripted gurney that when the Rat King walked up to it, it just let, sort of like smoothly like slid out of the way just to get that feeling of like, it's bearing down on you. You're having to like slow down for obstacles and then he just doesn't slow down at even a moment. He throws them out of the way. You're squeezing through things. You're getting running into false corners and getting turned around. Once we added the chase, the chase sort of fulfills the most obvious initial answer to encountering a monster like this. You should just run away, right? It's like, it's bigger than anything you've ever seen. It's way more armored than a bloater, which are, those are already big tanks, hard to take down. Like everyone's initial reaction is, I should just run away from this. So building in the chase scene allowed people to immediately like let that out a little bit and get into that space that they that feels natural. Fleeing from a monstrous amalgam of undead creatures trying to kill you is a pretty natural first response. But inevitably, Abby learns she can't outrun such a nightmare. She has to face it head on. Abby turns into fight mode and readies herself to actually, hopefully, just maybe, take this thing down. <laughs> Armed with whatever players accumulated in the sections prior, the Rat King fight itself is a fascinating one. 
While it is perhaps the most traditional boss encounter in The Last of Us Part 2, it's not a moment in which players need to immediately learn a brand new set of moves. While the team toyed with this idea, they eventually decided to lean into the player's existing skill set. We played around with that a little bit early on, but got to a point where we wanted to focus in on this being a fight that you play through with the mechanics you've learned throughout the whole game, but have it feel like it's being used against an enemy and in a context that is sort of like a level above anything you've run into before. That thought process not only applies to Abby's loadout, but also the moveset of the Rat King itself, which actually calls back to the insta-kill ability of bloaters in The Last of Us 1. The actual moves that it runs is like a hybrid of pretty much all of the infected. Like a, a T1 bloater, so he has like really uh, instant kill radius attacks. Uh, but he also has moves that we uh, developed for the Shambler, the new infected type for, for Last of Us 2. So he'll charge and he'll do like in-place spore cloud explosions, uh, acid clouds. And on top of that, he can still throw pustules. Uh, and he has, you know, his aggressive charge that will actually impact you and instant kill you as well. Uh, which is a, a T2 Last of Us Part 2 bloater move. That doesn't mean the developers didn't make some intriguing twists to set the mood of this fight and convey the inherent horror of the encounter. If you had a harder time seeing the Rat King from a distance, that was intentional. We were really specific with like how long the sight lines would be in this layout, uh, directly tied to how much light you could actually cast. Because we wanted uh, a moment of of like, you know, fear. Like you didn't know where the character was, but like here comes a Rat King like charging down this hallway towards you and you, you couldn't see him. You could only hear him until he catches like your, I think we tuned it down to like eight meters or something like that for your flashlight. But don't feel cheated. True to Naughty Dog's excellent attention to detail, there's a bit of in-universe explanation for your flashlight not working as well. Our real-time fog tech takes a big, big stage to, to create that atmosphere down there. It's really, really dense, so and that, that helps justify why our flashlight doesn't go so far. But yeah, it's one of our tricks. We, we tune flashlight settings per space. So like, it, you know, you could walk into a different room and boom, your flashlight's just not as good anymore. But of course, doing your best to whittle away a foe you can't always see well, who will corner you in seemingly tough dead ends, is just the first part of the fight. The Rat King has one surprise up its slimy sleeves that no other infected does. Probably the biggest thing that makes it stand apart is the fact that it splits apart halfway through the fight. That split created one of the more interesting sets of design challenges for the team. Firstly, how to convincingly make this creature separate from the body without disobeying the laws of physics already established in this universe. The size of the stalker that is attached, while he's attached, is actually about 20% bigger than what you end up fighting, um, which was, we wanted to be able to keep it at that larger size, but leaning into those uh, those goals of having it played out with normal mechanics, we had to honor that you should be able to melee fight with that stalker enemy. In order for melee to make sense at all with that enemy, we actually needed to, during the split, replace the actor with a different um, a different one that's the same size and make sure it looks, you know, bloodied in the same way and, and all this so that it's same, seamless to the player, but it's actually a smaller enemy that you start fighting. The smaller super stalker that goes off on its own can't be killed yet because the player is meant to chase it once the main body is taken down. But it's still a part of combat for a stretch of time and so the developers needed to balance how big a threat it could be. Then your split off super stalker was like trying to ambush you. He was hiding in the shadows and trying to pick moments to flank you uh, to make it really, really engaging. Um, of course, we, we tuned it so it wasn't too difficult, but um, yeah, their behaviors and in, in, uh, spe uh, specifically for the Super Stalker and how it's trying to ambush you and hide changes as the fight goes on. When you're fighting him solo, he's kind of like a different calculated beast. Part of what allows the Super Stalker to be employed this way, to not become the center point of your focus when you're meant to take down the much bigger baddie in front of you, is a fighting arena designed to let the Rat King be as intimidating as possible and let the player feel capable of pulling off a number of successful last minute escapes. Considering the amount of adrenaline pumping through your body as you fight the Rat King, it's likely not the first thing you notice, but this arena is carefully designed to loop in on itself, no matter what branch of it you blindly run down. 
a lot of the intention of this space was with very specific sight lines, so long sight lines. We have that like large corridor going down, but then pretty much every branch that you decide to go into acts as its own loop. Uh, and each loop has its own puzzle, right? So like you can get around either like by breaking a window and vaulting through, uh, or taking like a squeeze through that's kind of hidden. Uh, I think in the main room, it's more obvious. There's just like a center pillar that you can like loop around right there. It took a lot of iteration to settle on the clever final layout of the arena, which always keeps the player moving. We built it with almost every room had at least two like pretty distinct exits, if not three. And we found that that actually was making the fight worse. Players would run in loops in very small sections of the level. The Rat King would be doing these shambler bursts, so there'd be gas clouds, and people would just get turned around and completely lost. Like, it was hard for people to um, make a map of the space. At one point, we did this big pass where we closed off a bunch of connections. We even intentionally added a few pretty much dead ends where the only way to get out was to have these really close call runouts where you're just dashing just outside of the range of the Rat King. And it was like a light switch was flipped because the next focus test we did, all of a sudden people weren't getting lost as much. They were fighting the Rat King a lot more than they were. And they were just rating the level a lot higher. The Rat King will come in and, and like dynamically destroy walls. And this opens up uh, sight lines as well as like easier paths through pretty much each space that it could get into. It, it works in such a way where the Rat King can get within just meters of you, but you've got somewhere to go. You can scramble away pretty much everywhere. end result is a breathless but cathartic fight for Abby. The Rat King is this new, seemingly unstoppable foe, but by the time you actually fight it, Naughty Dog has given you all the mechanical knowledge to actually take it down. And even if Abby's world soon returns to something much more human as the rest of The Last of Us Part II's story plays out, the Rat King sticks with you. As the team reflected on crafting this particularly harrowing sequence of the sequel, Many of them spoke to how it represents so much more than just a unique boss fight. Even if some of that layered intention came out organically while developing it, rather than being a stated mission from the start. It needed to feel like this intense, scary thing that needed to be overcome and, you know, help Abby stand out as like having gone through that trial and, and having that be meaningful. As we started developing it, I noticed at some, at some point that there's a big parallel between Abby having sort of monstrous experiences in hospitals. And I think that the Rat King particularly, you know, to me was meant to feel, you know, really like a descent for Abby. Uh, it is a literal descent. She's kind of descending into this place that has been untouched for a long time and was a kind of a origin point for the infection in this area. So the idea that there's something down there sort of festering in the dark, I think speaks to a lot of the uh, themes of The Last of Us as a whole. You can see her trauma with her dad taking place in this like hospital environment and then having part of her redemption arc being going in and sort of like conquering a monster in that same sort of environment. That's one of my favorite aspects of how this relates to her story is that parallel. The Rat King reflected something greater than itself, not just in how it came to represent Abby's journey, but also in how it crystallizes just how much of a team effort every aspect of The Last of Us Part II is. The fact that our games can come out, uh, considering how big they are, how ambitious, um, I think really speaks to our ability to collaborate as a team. You know, we have a huge environment art team, all of our art directors, uh, you know, our animators and our animation leads, you know, all the game directors, Neil, our level designers. All of this is an iterative process over months and months of everyone really putting their heart into it and really wanting to make this section of the game work really, really well. So uh, it's definitely something that I'm proud of and I think a lot of people that worked on it are. Thank you so much for watching our latest Art of the Level. Let us know what games and levels you would like to see us dive into next. And for another look at a memorable PlayStation moment, be sure to watch our Art of the Level on Ghost of Tsushima's opening credit scene.